The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Security Industry Association's webinar on maritime cybersecurity. I'm Ron Hawkins, SIA's Director of Industry Relations, and this webinar is the latest in our Security Practitioner Insight series, which focuses on the security challenges within various sectors. I know many of the people on the line are already familiar with SIA, but for those who are not, we are the leading trade association for companies in the electronic physical security industry, with about 650 members, including manufacturers, integrators, distributors, and service providers. We provide our members with a variety of benefits and services in the areas of education, government relations, standards development, networking, events, and research. With physical security overlapping more and more with cybersecurity, SIA is moving aggressively into the cyber field with events such as this webinar, with an upcoming cybersecurity edition of SIA Technology Insights, and with the creation of the SIA Cybersecurity Advisory Board. We are the sole sponsor, the sole industry sponsor of ISC West, and if you're going to be at the show in April, please stop by our booth, number 3065. Now, we are very pleased to have two experts with us today to discuss cybersecurity issues as they relate to ports. Brett Rouser is the Chief of Maritime Critical Infrastructure and Key Resources Protection for the U.S. Coast Guard Cyber Command, and he'll be providing an overview of cybersecurity and the maritime transportation system. And April Danos is Director of Information Technology for the Greater LaForce Port Commission in Louisiana, and she'll be providing the port perspective on these issues. We invite you to submit questions through the webinar dashboard, and we'll answer as many of them as we can after the presentations. And to preemptively answer one question that we always get, we will email each of you links to the PowerPoint deck and to a recording of the webinar. With all of that having been said, I will turn things over to our first presenter, Brett Rouser. Brett? Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brett Rouser, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here to speak with you this afternoon. And it's uh, nice to be back on a panel discussion with April. Uh, she's a fantastic partner in this presentation series, so I'm looking forward to uh, taking any questions you have and uh, engaging you with uh, any questions regarding maritime cybersecurity and uh, marine transportation system. I'm currently detailed to the Department of Homeland Security National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center in Arlington, Virginia, where I am. Uh, integrate with about uh, 18 to 19 uh, different organizations here, all dealing with uh, cybersecurity issues impacting the 16 critical sectors throughout the United States. So with that, I'll go ahead and get started. And um, next slide, please. So why is maritime so important? And it's a, it's a great opportunity to have this discussion with the folks on the phone today is really from a, a maritime perspective, it's critical to both the national security and national economy of the United States. When you look at some of the statistics that are displayed there on the slide, I mean, they're, they're pretty powerful numbers. 95% of all U.S. overseas trade goes through the 360 ports of the nation. And in the price tag there you see for cargo handled annually, $4.3 trillion, really goes to the, the heart of the issue and why maritime is so important. In addition to the, you know, the monetary value that it provides to the nation and to the nation's economy, our ports and waterways also serve as key military outlet facilities, enabling the Department of Defense and other agencies the ability to project uh, military power in time of crisis and war. So keeping these ports and, and waterways safe, secure, and resilient is paramount to the Coast Guard and our maritime stakeholder partners. Next slide, please. So when you look at maritime, I, I would really kind of challenge folks out there that, you know, very few sectors such as the maritime transportation sector have so many intermodal touch points and connectivities into the nation. You know, our ports and waterways serve as the hub to rail, trucking, uh, energy, pipeline, and a lot of other different uh, industries throughout the, throughout the domain. So as you can see from the depiction on the slide here, our, our ports are really that, that central nexus and first entry port into the, the United States for a lot of those cr critical functions. Again, what we've seen in the past is you know, an impact to one of those intermodal touch points, whether it be from a physical perspective or a cyber perspective, can have trickle-down effects onto those other touch points throughout that maritime domain. Next slide. So again, I, just for those who are unfamiliar with cargo operations, these are how things were managed back in the day. Uh, a lot of people with uh, man 
uh, people in cranes, people physically moving cargo on and off of ships, onto the onto trucks, under other forms of conveyance. And really, as the evolution of the transportation industry, specifically maritime, is taking place, if you could go to the next slide, please. This is really how things have evolved in our ports and waterways. I would argue that there's really not a system inside our port and the facilities that handle these cargos that really aren't connected to or touch some type of cyber system, whether that be the security to gain access to the facility via toy card, security camera systems, uh, cranes that are fed by GPS and unmanned, the ability to move uh, containers on and off a vessel seamlessly onto awaiting trucks, and the ability to track that cargo real time from point of embarkation to point of debarkation really illustrate the, the interconnected nature and the cyber reliance on our nation's ports and waterways. Next slide, please. Again, I joke uh, uh, with a lot of the folks in my office, I was not on board this Coast Guard ship. I retired from the Coast Guard back in 2009, and no, uh, I am old, but not quite this old. Uh, so I was not on board a ship like this, but the, you know, the evolution of our ports are really tied in conjunction to the evolution of our modern-day shipping fleet that uh, travels the globe carrying goods throughout the throughout the world. Next slide. As with our ports and waterways, ships are equally as dependent on cyber technologies for both efficiency as well as key safety functions on board vessels, whether that be navigation, uh, fire suppression, voyage data recorders, navigational things, or other key safety components on board the ship, today's modern shipping fleet is really, really reliant on cyber and IT systems to maintain the efficiency and operations to operate today's global economy. Next slide. The next couple of slides, I wanted to walk you through a couple of things that we're see, we have seen in the maritime with regards to uh, cyber activity and how it's really evolved and it had some impacts on, on the maritime industry. For those of you who are unfamiliar with, this is a, a case where a drug trafficking organization over in Antwerp utilized hackers to facilitate drug smuggling. How they accomplished this is they took a uh, provided okay, yeah, uh, spear phishing email yeah, into the point of embarkation right, for the cargo down, container right. that they were using to smuggle both cocaine and heroin and were able to gain access through a spear phishing email. On the delivery side of the industry, uh, they the facility was a little more cyber secure, a little more cyber resilient, and they did not uh, click on the, the email. So they did a, a physical break into the facility and implanted key loggers onto the company system in order to gain access to company networks. This allowed them access to uh, gain access to the, the pin code to gain access to the facility, and they were able to bring a truck onto the facility that they had a driver employed on and offload the container directly onto the truck and drive away. This is really kind of the first instance where we saw a compromise of the supply chain for using a, you know, cyber techniques to smuggle illicit cargo such as drugs. When you look at things like uh, this scenario, uh, you can change what you want in that container, change it to guns, people, money, or something a little more nefarious. So you can see the, the criticality of uh, maintaining the security and integrity of the supply chain. Next slide. Again, another uh, kind of indication of the critical reliance on uh, cyber systems and technologies. This was a targeted attack against the Iranian shipping line uh, known as RISL. Uh, this attack damaged all data related to shipping rates, loading cargo number, date and location of, of vessels and containers as they made their transit throughout the globe. Uh, a significant impact to the company's operation, uh, providing severe financial losses to the facility until they were able to recover from this, uh, this breach and this attack to gain that information and access to those critical files in order to maintain and, and uh, continue operations at really the speed of service is expected of the maritime transportation system up today. Next slide. Again, much like the other 16 sectors, uh, the maritime is not immune to uh, disgruntled employees or insider threats. Uh, this was an instance where a uh, a refinery was targeted by targeted by a disgruntled employee who uh, 
was going around from computer to computer with a USB drive, loading malicious files onto the computer system, impacting the company's business networks. Again, uh, something that we've seen throughout the other sectors, and, and Maritime is no exception. The insider threat is very real and something that uh, IT professionals and companies out there need to be aware of. This instance required uh, the facility to hire a third party to come in and remediate uh, the malware that had been loaded onto the systems. Next slide. If you uh, ever ever hear the comment on the Coast Guard speak, uh, this is one of the things that really kind of concerns him and keeps him up at night. This was the instance of a uh, a breach, cyber breach on board a uh, a floating oil rig off the coast of Africa, which the malicious malware on board the facility uh, forced it to shut down. It took a week to mitigate the effects. Again, one of the things that we're very concerned about with the Coast Guard is, you know, with, with the offshore drilling world, is the dynamic position and stabilization of these oil rigs and platforms and mobile offshore drilling units. A lot of them rely fully on cyber and IT dependent systems to keep them in, in place above the, the wellhead. So ensuring that data integrity and the ability for them to maintain station and uh, not have any type of emergency breakaway is critical to uh, protecting both the environment and also the, uh, the folks on board that platform. Next slide. Again, it's not all the, not all the cyber things that we're seeing are uh, related to nefarious or, or bad guy actors out there in cyberspace. This was simply a case of a uh, software patch that's gone bad. We're working with the government, we have these, again, we're no exception, the government has these all the time, where a patch takes and uh, causes some uh, difficulties or loss of functionality that no one had anticipated. This impacted a, a facility and shut down their ground container tracking system. So over a six hour period, we can kind of see that ripple effect on how it, it impacted those intermodal touch points because it impacted the facility's ability to offload containers onto awaiting trucks, causing a, a 350 truck uh, backlog in the gates waiting to move those containers until the software system was restored. Next slide. Again, these things are, uh, as we talk about the uh, things we, you'll hear often things in the news with malware and crimeware and ransomware and things like that. Again, many of these things will sit there and lie dormant on, on computer systems. Again, Maritime is no exception. This was a malware infection that was related to criminal activity. And you can see based on the slide there, the initial infection onto the computer took place in September of 2014. It wasn't detected till the end of April in 2015. So this, this malware was laying there on this company network for several months, providing an intruder access into uh, critical files at the facility. Again, this was impacted business systems on any type of uh, production systems. Next slide. When I spoke a little bit earlier about the, you know, the speed and efficiency of the MTS, a lot of the containers are offloaded by autonomous cranes today, meaning that you don't have an individual sitting in there driving the, the crane anymore. A lot of them are controlled by cyber IT systems that rely heavily on GPS. This was an instance where there was a GPS disruption that lasted approximately seven hours. It impacted several of this facility's shipboard cranes, basically rendering them useless. Next slide, please. Recently, we received some reports regarding a uh, vulnerability to uh, shipboard voyage data recorders. Uh, the best analogy that I can give you for these, these are kind of the black boxes that are on board airplanes. Uh, they capture key critical data on board a ship. They would be, you know, used by marine investigators in the course of their accident investigation. Should there be a maritime uh, maritime casualty, these things capture uh, position, course, speed, communications, both on the bridge of the ship, as well as radio communications and other key safety functions. Well, it was discovered that, that several of these systems were valuable, were vulnerable to data deletion or data manipulation which can bring into question evidentiary gatherings during a marine casualty investigation, impeding the ability to really kind of find out what happened during a maritime event. Next slide. When we talk about these things, the two slides I showed you earlier with uh, the port facility and the vessel, 
one of the things is it's really critical, and these are the things that kind of keep me up at night, are the reliance on industrial control systems and supervisory control and data acquisition systems. These are the things that do physical things on board a, a vessel and a facility. They control product flow, uh, opening of gates, control of fire suppression things of that nature. So the kinetic effects are often controlled by industrial control systems. They're, they're out there everywhere. If you look at the thermometer in your, your home or the facility that you work, that's connected to an, an industrial control system. Elevator controls, toll plazas, all run off of industrial control systems. So they're really proliferated throughout all the 16 sectors that are out there. Next slide, please. So again, the, the 2015 statistics, which should be out soon, but these are based on 2014 standards. Uh, these are industrial control system incidents by sector. Uh, and again, these are the ones that we know. So a total of 245 events which were reported and detected in 2014. So you can see the different diversity of, of, of sectors that were impacted out there. One of the things that's important to understand about industrial control systems is many of these things are, are using 20-year-old technology. So a lot of people ask why they still use that technology. It's because it's good. It doesn't break. It does what it's supposed to do. And the, the vulnerabilities and, and threats were really introduced. We started to try and gain efficiencies by connecting these control systems to the Internet. So for instance, instead of having a technician drive three or four hours to troubleshoot a problem on a control system, they're able to now remote into that control system remotely, creating an increased threat surface. So that again, the, the efficiency that the, the maritime relies on, again, this holds true for all the other 16 sectors as well, has, has driven this, you know, this ability to be able to gain instantaneous access to, uh, to key systems. So by trying to capitalize on those efficiency, we've created a bit of a, a threat challenge to uh, industrial control systems. Next slide. Again, this uh, here is a breakdown of incident threat actors. When we talk about APTs, those are your advanced persistent threat actors, and I'm sure uh, most of the folks on the call are aware of those. Those are kind of your uh, heavy nation state actors. Everyone's familiar with the Russias, the Chinas, and the other big uh, nation states who have a robust cybersecurity capability. They get broken down by criminals, activists, and uh, insiders, and, and other events where we simply don't know yet. Next slide. So I wanted to touch base quickly on, on the Coast Guard cyber strategy. Uh, this was released by the Commandant of the Coast Guard in June of 2015. And for those, uh, it's uh, readily available on the Coast Guard website. You can search for Coast Guard cyber strategy and pull it down at your leisure to, to read through it. But really what this does is that the Coast Guard's really kind of first initial salvo into trying to understand and articulate what cybersecurity means for the Coast Guard and for our maritime partners. And it focuses primarily on three strategic priorities that you can see there on the slide. Defending cyberspace, and in a nutshell, what that means is the Coast Guard relies, just like everybody else, on cyber systems to be effective and carry out our day-to-day -day operations and missions. So we've got to make sure that our own networks are safe, secure, and resilient in order for us to be effective and maintain operations in the Coast Guard. The second strategic priority is enabling operations. How can we as a service, in partnership with our other federal partners, leverage cyber capabilities to be more effective in our day-to-day -day missions? How are we able to detect, deter, and disable and defeat adversaries and lever by leveraging cyber capabilities and the unique authorities that the Coast Guard brings to bear to make us more effective in, in mission sets uh, like counter-drug operations? And the third strategic priority is the one where I focus my, uh, most of my world of work. It's protecting infrastructure. This is how we protect the maritime infrastructure from attacks, disasters, and accidents. And it's really kind of, um, again, this strategy lays out from a cyber perspective, but when you look at it as a whole, it's really the all hazards, all threats approach, whether that's physical or cyber. And as, as Ron kind of teed off at the beginning of the discussion, those are quickly overlapping and uh, have heavily dependence on one another. Next slide, please. I think I made it within my window of time here. So uh, again, I, I know that we're uh, having a Q&A session at the end, so I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today and happy to answer any questions you have at the end of the, end of the webinar. 
All right, thank you, Brett. Uh, some great information there. Now to give us an idea of how individual ports see this topic, we'll turn it over to April Danos. April? Thank you. Good afternoon. It's always a pleasure to work with Brett and, uh, and speak um, after him or with him. So um, the maritime cybersecurity and the port perspective. Port cybersecurity is a critical issue to maintain both public and commercial security. Hackers working as criminals or terrorists have the ability to remotely steal sensitive information from databases operate automated equipment, and manipulate access control that is vital to the daily safe operations of the port. Today we will examine the port's perspective. Before I get into that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Port Fouchon. Um, I was introduced as being the Director of IT for the Greater Lafourche Port Commission. I'm also um, the American Association of Port Authorities uh, Cybersecurity Subcommittee Chair. And uh, so Port Fouchon is critical to the communities um, and, and we need to understand and take ownership of the strategic importance of cybersecurity, including how those functions relate to other business goals. So Port Fouchon is in the southernmost port in Louisiana and our prime position is in the central Gulf of Mexico, approximately 60 miles southeast of New Orleans. Port Fouchon services about 90% of all the deep water oil and gas activities in the Gulf. The port also serves as the land base for the Louisiana Offshore Oil Port, which we call the Loop, which is the nation's only deep water oil port. It's located 18 miles offshore and Loop provides direct pipeline support for the offloading and loading of ultra-large crew carriers and very large crew carriers and is directly connected to over 50% of the nation's refining capacity. In total, Port Fouchon plays a strategic role in furnishing this country about 20% of the nation's oil supply. Next slide, please. So Port Fouchon is only one reason why it is so critical that port communities understand and take ownership for the strategic importance of cybersecurity as it relates to other business goals. Cybersecurity is everyone's responsibility. However, it is important to understand that each port is a unique business entity that has different governing structures from other ports, as well as different business models, which can change often. It's often said about ports that if you've seen one port, you've only seen one port. There's, a, there's no cookie-cutter approach or one-size-fits-all to cybersecurity in ports. It's also important to note that the port information technology leaders, along with our counterparts in the private industry and other critical infrastructure, have been confronting the threat of cybersecurity for some time. We didn't just start this yesterday or in 2013 when um, the presidential directive came out. Next slide, please. So how are America's ports addressing cybersecurity? AAPA, the American Association of Port Authorities, uh, for those who don't know, is a trade association that represents deep draft public port authorities throughout the U.S., Canada, Latin America, and the Caribbean. They have an extensive education and training program. They conduct research and compile industry surveys. They distribute a variety of newsletters, offer public relations and information services for port pro professionals. For U.S. members, they also provide advocacy services. Some of the things we've done is in October of 2013, the AAPA IT Committee created the IT Cybersecurity Subcommittee. We meet monthly to discuss the, the threats at hand as well as um, the ongoing um, legislation and um, work with our, our Coast Guard. We have a very close relationship and just brought on board in the last month or so Lieutenant Josh Rose and Lieutenant Josephine uh, Long uh, from the Critical Infrastructure Protection Branch. They are now on our AAPA IT um, cybersecurity subcommittee. Um, they work with us to develop best practices. Um, they come to us with questions as they develop their um, cybersecurity policies and procedures and, and how are, are ports in general um, reporting out information and uh, things of, of that nature, like what, what are we reporting, how do we report, and we're trying to formulate something that is going to work both for the Coast Guard and the ports without having any mandates put on us. 
Um, the Cybersecurity Subcommittee also work on developing best practices, and we respond to requests for information in reference to cybersecurity for our port, such as the NIST framework, the Coast Guard docket, 2014-1020, uh, government relations priorities and cybersecurity, um, HR 3878, and uh, was also part of the Transportation Security Sector Cybersecurity Working Group um, in formulating what the common cyber language should be. Next slide, please. So what's next for us? Um, in 2016, there's a Port Security and IT Seminar and Exposition in Arlington, Virginia. It's our spring conference. We'll have breakout sessions. Um, this is July 20th to 22nd, and uh, we'll, we'll be breaking out with Coast Guard and, and some folks talking about cybersecurity and um, what our next steps are. We're currently responding to the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, RFI, HR 3878, and Coast Guard recently released some comments on the NIST Maritime Bulk Liquid Profile that our committee is looking at and providing comments back to uh, Lieutenant Josephine Long and uh, Lieutenant Josh Rose. The AAPA Security Committee is also putting out a survey to ports to determine where ports are in general with cybersecurity. We have a, a survey going out to try and see where are we at with risk assessments, um, port security grant funding, and, and things of that nature. Next slide, please. Well, who's responsible for maintaining cybersecurity? So security technology, although it's amazing, it makes us more prepared than ever before for just about any hazard imaginable. We are blind, useless, and potentially locked out of our own house if we are hacked. And let's face it, it isn't if, but when. This makes cybersecurity more important than ever before and truly brings the physical and cyber threats to the same playing field. As you heard Brett uh, talk about earlier about smuggling drugs, that is a definite cyber and physical security um, issue um, in one. Support maritime domain awareness systems um, that include CCTV, video management systems, access control, radar, and AIS to monitor vessels, incident management systems, command and control systems, disparate data layers, intelligence sharing into common op operating platforms for greater situational awareness. These are all terms used um, on the physical security side where all these systems, through port security grants mainly, uh, brought in all of these systems. In some cases, the IT departments were not involved and in putting in these technologies, and the port security departments heavily relied on vendors to come in and, and put in these systems. So when we talk about systems, whether they're legacy systems or they're new systems, some of the things that the IT folks are responsible for is making sure that those systems are secure, meaning um, we've come across vendors coming in and, and putting in the system with a generic password. And that generic password is known for that system all around the world. Um, it's up to the folks in IT and, and the security folks to be on top of that and make sure we have some standards in place that those passwords get changed and those um, systems become secure. Uh, we've put in a lot of wireless equipment in our ports. Are those wireless devices secure? And these are things that if you're not in the IT and you are in the physical side or you are a port director, these are the things you should be asking your people. Are, are we securing our systems, these systems that we're putting in? I'm not in any way dogging any vendor or anything. It's just this is the nature of the beast. This is where we are today. Um, systems we're putting in, and we should backtrack and make sure they're secure. March 3, 2016, Homeland Security National Protection Program Directorate Office of Cyber and Infrastructure Analysis put out a report on consequences to seaport operations for malicious cybersecurity activity. This is out on the web. It's available for anyone to go and look at. Um, the vulnerabilities um, founded were limited cybersecurity training and preparedness, errors in software, which I'll just explain inadequately protected commercial off-the-shelf technologies and legacy systems, network connectivity, jamming, spoofing, insider threats is a big one. Um, 
cyber attack on the network at a port or aboard a ship results in lost cargo, port disruptions, and delays for weeks. Impacts to critical infrastructure will always depend on the level and length of the disruption, the capability to divert shipments to other ports. Is there, it's, it's, as you could see in, in the earlier example, they were able to um, move cargo um, by attacking the, the system. Um, just yesterday I was reading an article about um, another example where the pirates were getting into a content management system to get to the cargo and the next step is that they're going to start relocating that cargo without anyone's knowledge and basically get that cargo delivered to their doorstep. Um, mitigation measures increase the security and resiliency of ports. So this report says that we should set up maritime cybersecurity standards, share information across the sector, conduct routine vulnerability assessments, use best practices, mitigate insider threats, and develop contingency plans for cyber attacks. Next slide, please. So some of the best practices, ports are encouraged to develop an incident response plan and include cybersecurity as a portion of their plan, encouraged to work with your security department. Ports are also encouraged to work with federal agencies on breaches of cybersecurity. Make sure you have a relationship with your local law enforcement agency, your local Coast Guard, um, your local FBI, Secret Service and the Department of Homeland Security. There's lots of stuff out there. They're they're willing to help. Um, just get to know them before an incident happens, so you know who to call and you have that relationship. And then educate your end users. And that's uh, next slide, please. That's one of the biggest um, issues. And I have this little cartoon up and kind of um, the easiest way for someone to get into your system. And I'm sure we all have these people working at our offices that someone from ABC Company is going to call in and say, I'm Joe with ABC Company, and I'm, I need the password to your computer because I need to apply a cybersecurity patch. And they give them the password. So they just gave them the, the key to the kingdom. So educating our users, the insider threat, um, can protect us from a lot of things um, on the back end. Next slide, please. So the top three priorities for AAPA member ports is the presidential order on cybersecurity, reading, understanding, and following, uh, working with U.S. Coast Guard in developing uh, a move, a path forward, helping them develop uh, their goals and um, and what would work best for ports without mandating or, or regulating us in any further way. And then the port security grant program, working to make sure that funding is still available as we move forward on cybersecurity. Um, we're, it's just like physical security. It's constantly changing. And there's always some new technology or something new we need to protect that we'll, we'll need some uh, funding to do so. Next slide, please. So in closing, cybersecurity security truly is everyone's responsibility. Little things add up to big things. Cybersecurity risks are not owned solely by the IT department. From employees walking away from their desks without locking their computers, to plugging in and opening an unknown USB stick found in the parking lot, to working remotely in a dodgy internet cafe, to check email in Abu Dhabi, to loaning someone else their identification card, or not vetting IT contracts. In short, port managers and our response partners across all levels of government need to remember and constantly remind our workforce that everyone has a vital role to play in continuing to provide layered cybersecurity to our ports and to the nation. Next slide. And that concludes my uh, presentation. All right. Thank you, April. Very informative. A uh, lot of good stuff there. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions for the two of you. Let's see. Where do you think ports in general are in terms of cybersecurity compared to where they need to be? So um, that's what our survey is um, is getting towards, is trying to figure that out. Um, I know since I've been on the AAPA IT committee and the cybersecurity subcommittee, we have come a long way and ports are taking it seriously and are doing what they need to do with what they have. 
um, to give some kind of percentage, I really don't have that, but I know it's um, since 2013, I've, I've seen it grow tremendously. Mm -hmm. Now you bring up a great point, April, and again, I think you'll see you'll see the the wide range of of, of 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 people who are you know on the high end of cybersecurity and some that are on the low end, and that's why cyber is such a tough issue. It's a many times it's it's a business case decision for some of those smaller facilities, and you know when you look at at cyber kind of at a holistic nature, it's there's no silver bullet that you can buy out there that's going to protect everything. Um, but again, it's it's kind of understanding what's the critical of the most critical systems that you have, and what do you have to have operational, and 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 fully functional. So that's where a lot of people will make their investitures to make sure that their uh, their systems are, are safe, secure, and resilient. So it's a, it's a it's a it's a tough problem. And again, there's it's a it's a pretty good mix. And again, maritime is no different than the other 16 sectors out there. And I think you would see the same uh, same kind of uh, broad aperture across those sectors as well. Also, you know, um, from the IT perspective, um, it's hard to gauge any of this because some of this stuff we feel as IT um, folks that giving out answers to where we are as a port is um, kind of giving away some of our secrets. Um, so it's, it's kind of like social media where the more information you put out about you, your person, um, the more someone could piece together and steal your identity. So it's the same way for us on the court side where we're not wanting to answer too many questions about where we are with uh, cybersecurity as a port for fear that someone will piece some things together and say, oh, well, that port didn't do a cyber assessment, so or that port's not doing this, so they may we may be able to get get into them, hmm. you know. So there's some concerns with even giving that information out. So I don't know if we'll ever really know where ports are. All right, good point. Uh, April, you mentioned the Port Security Grant Program. I, I know that's something that SIA has worked with AAPA on uh, for several years. But we had a question about how individual ports can go about uh, taking advantage of that program. Okay, so um, typically the ports um, security folks have been responsible or, or have, or, or if you have a grants administrator who's handling the grant, um, I would talk to them first and fit, find out um, if, you know, they're probably, they, everybody could apply, so I think it's three projects, and um, might want to work with those folks, whoever's managing the port security grants for the port. Um, in, in applying for a cybersecurity grant. Um, it is in there. The recommendation is that you first apply and do, if you haven't already done so, do a cyber assessment. You can apply for port security grant funds to do a cyber assessment. Um, but that, that would be my first thing is I would go directly to whoever's handling the port security grant. If it's a port that hasn't touched port security grants at all, then um, on the DHS website, they should have all the information you need um, about the port security grant. Yeah, and that, that, that's a great point, April. I mean, we, we've kind of seen a shift in the last year or so when it comes to cybersecurity and the, and the port security grant program. I mean, a lot of folks in a lot of the, the sectors and, and partners that I speak with have is, you know, in the post 9-11 world, everybody focused on physical security. We bought all the fire boats and their, their radiation detection gear and, and all the security systems and cameras and, and all of those things. So now it's, you know, as we've, we've built up that infrastructure from the physical side, now we're starting to catch up or try to catch up a little bit from the, from the cyber security perspective. So I know there's a pretty good taste for, uh, for cyber security submissions under the, the port security grant program, and I think we'll... Uh, continue to see those uh, packages grow in the next couple couple years. Yeah, agree. All right, a couple more questions. How should ports go about enlisting the support of industry experts to help with analysis and recommendations for cyber best practices? That's a good question. 
Who, who, um, should, who should they be looking to partner with? How should they how should they go about that? Yeah, I mean, April. I think April touched on it a lot on her uh, on her presentation. There's there's a lot of resources that are available out there to to industry, and, and like she pointed out, you want to establish those relationships early on. And again, with whether that's your local Coast Guard command or you know your other law enforcement partners or other port partners in general, to kind of understand. Uh, you know the cyber perspective in the maritime. Uh, there's no lack of um, third-party vendors and things out there who will offer assessments and things like that. So I, I really can't speak to that or endorse one above the other. But again, establishing those relationships with the stakeholders there in your port, it really would be my first recommendation to make sure that you know you know who to call if something happens. And and, and again, that will enhance the information sharing as. As, as things start to pop and people start to th see things uh, specifically in the maritime. Yeah. And DHS, um, I know DHS is, is willing to be a partner as well. And um, they have the lo you know your local FBI and so forth. They have different types of programs. I know um, in Louisiana we have InfraGuard, and I think InfraGuard's um, pretty much all over now. But that would be your FBI. And there's different programs. That you can get into that that they'll give you the information about what to watch for, what's the biggest threat, you know, um, and also work with you to even checking your systems. And I think some of these programs are there's no charge. Yeah, D DHS offers a lot of uh, a lot of assessments and things like that that they can come out and do. They'll do a design architecture review of of a control system network to make sure there's no. Uh, no gaps or things like that, and a lot of those things are are free of charge. Each region has a has established a cybersecurity advisor uh, who works for DHS. I think there's about nine of those folks nationwide, but they're a great resource for cyber information. And uh, at each uh, region also has a physical security advisor as well that, that DHS has uh, has uh, put out in the field as well. So. What I can do is I'll uh, I'll look to pull a list of those folks and uh, see if I can pass that off to Ron for for further distribution if you think that'd be helpful. All right, great, thanks, Fred. That'd be excellent. Uh, here's an interesting one: Is it okay for a victimized organization to hack back? What are the dangers? I, I mean, from my perspective as an IT, I would say no. I don't think you hack back. I think you call the authorities. And um, you know, in typically we would say unplug your systems to stop the attack from hampering the rest of your system. Um, but today, there we're trying to make sure that you can um, that the authorities can come in and determine where those hacks are coming and kind of shut it down, basically. Yeah, I, I, for... I don't recommend hacking back. <laughs> yeah, I would I would not recommend that as well. I think the best course of action is to contact contact law enforcement and let them uh, let them deal with the situation. Once you've uh, kind of made sure your uh, networks are you know, have stopped the uh, stopped the impact. All right, I think this is our last question. Uh, it's actually a two-parter. Do ports need to look for a special cybersecurity services firm that understands port operations and U.S. Coast Guard operations? And the second part is, would a typical cybersecurity firm be fit for assessing in a port environment? So will any cybersecurity firm do, or should they be looking for people for a firm who is focused on, on ports and maritime? My recommendation would be to find someone that focuses on ports and, and the maritime industry, because it is a, a different animal. Um, you have to be able to understand ports and how we operate. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, I, w I would agree. And like like April pointed out, once you've seen one port, you've seen one port. They're all different, and uh, you know the, the interconnected touch points and you know the products that they move and the networks that they employ are all all kind of different. And I think it's important for a firm that would come in and, and do something like that to have some knowledge and understanding of of, of how a facility operates. And to understand the, you know, the critical nodes that are out there to be able to allow that port or facility to continue to function. So, yeah, I would look for one that's got some uh, some maritime experience. All right, thank you for that. 
And that does it for our Q&A session. So I think that wraps things up for us today. Thank you again, Brett Naple, for sharing your expertise with us and uh, helping people navigate these very complex issues. And thank you to all of you in attendance for spending part of your day with us. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to me using the contact information on this slide. So thank you all one more time, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Ron.